like and subscribe to our channels for new episodes and updates. On this week's Coffee Break, our guest host, April Sands, sits down with our guest, co-chair of the PLP's COVID-19 Task Force, Dr. Melissa Evans. guest host April Sands and we're here with another special guest. She has a lengthy resume so I'm going to be reading this. She is a co-chair of the PLP COVID task force. She has a bachelor's in health science with a focus in epidemiology and a doctorate in health science with a specialization in global health. Not to mention she's trained, she's a trained respiratory specialist and she's also the founder of Sleep Solutions. Please welcome to the table today, Dr. Melissa Evans. How are you? I'm good. Thank you so much for having me. No, thank you for being here today. Um, we have a lot to cover. I have yes. so many questions for you, um, just because this is a, you're, you're the first guest who would have so much knowledge in the uh, area of health. And as you know, we're in a health crisis. Yes, unfortunately. So we can find some answers, hopefully, with you today. Yes. So you've been home for just about 10 years, right. serving in the arena of sleep disorders. Right. However, prior to being home, you had a pretty commendable background in overall healthcare, um, but on a global scale. This includes serving in the U.S. military in the Infectious Disease Department, which included working on the front lines with the 2003 outbreak of SARS back in Germany. I know you're a woman of research, which you noted with me today. So what have you seen between then and now with the two pandemics? Um, really, really good questions, um, and, and it's a really significant question. The biggest difference between the, the outbreak in 2000, late 2002 and into 2003 with SARS, um, comparably with COVID-19 now, is A, the numbers. The numbers are significantly higher. Um, the transmission rate is, is of course, um, something to, to look at and it's 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 way you know we're transmitting the, the virus way faster than SARS ever did it is spread globally worldwide um, in most countries and so there is a significant significant difference between mm. SARS in 2003 and we have as, as coronavirus or COVID-19 now currently why do you think uh, coronavirus in particular would have outlasted at least seemingly I mean you would have more information than I would outlasted what seems to be previous uh, pandemics prior to. What's so special about this particular virus? I'll tell you that worldwide, um, I've said this before um, many times, that um, this particular pandemic or this particular virus um, is way, way different than what we've seen in the past. Um, and so scientists around the world, we're tr they're trying to put um, a finger on exactly what's going on. Um, the virus has variable strains. We've seen that and that's why it's such a challenge for us to find a vaccine that's going to work effectively um, and also to find treatment modalities that are also going to work effectively. And that's why it's become such a word, worldwide global challenge for healthcare professionals because it behaves in a different way. Yes, it's a respiratory disease and it's transmitted um, similarly to the previous SARS and similarly to influenza. Uh, um, but uh, the symptoms are, are significantly worse. Mm -hmm. The transmission rate is faster. Um, and so we're looking at greater numbers. The death rate by far is way greater than anything that we've seen before. And so this is why um, this particular pandemic is such a, a worrisome one for, for all healthcare professionals, scientists globally. Is it the, is the, is the greater... Uh, or is the distinct factor because of the transmission of it? Is it because, well, they still don't know even if it's airborne or not. I know they've been going back and forth with that. Would you think that's a particular part of the virus that is really has really caused it to be what it is now? I think I think that's that's a really, really important factor. Um, another important factor is uh, the complications of of one once it's trans transmitted, what it does physiologically to the body, how it attacks the respiratory system, how it behaves once it once, um, you know, it, it, it does enter through 
via, uh, via respiratory droplets mm -hmm. and um, it is transmitted. Just the behavior of the virus is something um, to be studied and examined really, really closely. And so that's what's really, really causing, you know, a problem and, and, and thus such a, a large death rate. And is it also peculiar that, I mean, or maybe not peculiar that it obviously affects people differently. Yeah. Some people have absolutely right. no symptoms. Correct. And yes. then some people, obviously, it can lead to fatality. So, right. I mean, that's that's a very, very interesting point. I, I know when we first um, introduced, when the World Health Organization um, named COVID-19 a pandemic back in March, I think it was when we gave our, our first introduction to the virus, um, we noted then that um, the virus, you know, behaved as, as scientists had seen in a certain way. And um, that was merely about seven months ago. And we've noted that, uh, you know, that has changed variably. We know then we, we saw that um, maybe just it affected more people that had chronic illness or that were older. We, you know, that's what we looked at at the beginning. Now we're seeing that um, this virus attacks anyone and, and, you know, people that are young, old, children, babies, infants, um, people that are healthy, are being affected. There are people that um, that are that have chronic illness that that do very well. You know what I mean. And so now we're looking at a whole different picture. It, is it based on your immunity? Um, currently, when if it's transmitted, what is it based on? Basically, and, and and again, we're as as a scientist, we're trying to look at the data and see exactly um, if are these variable strains that are attacking now are the strains that we're seeing now different than what we saw back in March. So since serving, obviously, on the PLP COVID task force, what has been a primary focus for you all and what has really been accomplished from the group so far? Um, when we initially sat down and decided, um, the leadership of the party decided that, you know, when we first got knowledge of the virus and the plausible pandemic, it hadn't been deemed a pandemic at that point, it was initially before that, um, the goal of the, the leadership was to, to put together a task force that would work hand in hand with the Ministry of Health um, and in, in order to combat such a you know potential pandemic at that point. So it has been our goal, the goal of the task force to, to gather da data, put together plans of action, um, support, do anything we can do to support the government or the Ministry of Health in um, any type of treatment um, variables, any any type of help that you know they might need as far as information is concerned, com um, community education. And so we've been actively engaged for the past seven months um, as a team and just trying to just figure out, you know, exactly what we're looking at as a country, how, what we can do to, to help it, help along um, anything that might be, you know, happening as far as the ministry is concerned, the Ministry of Health, and um, to also put our, our, our action plan in place. So the party has a COVID action plan that can be found at covidactionplan.org. Um, and it basically is an action plan that we've put together um, to, to effectively try and not only um, Tests and, and treat and track and isolate and but just just, just to give the, the general public knowledge about what this pandemic is, what's the best way to combat it, to fight it, to protect yourself, and um, how we can effectively get past this as a community, as a country. So that's the goal of the of the task force. And and speaking of which, obviously, as you would have mentioned previously, we've been here since March and yeah. there have been implementations right. in place from yes. this administration. Yes. Um, in your opinion, you know, what should we be doing? Because I know obviously we have been implementing lockdowns. What do you think about these weekend lockdowns? And why are we here? <laughs> are they, are they doing anything for us? At this point, I don't think so. I really don't think so because um, what I what I've been you know visually seeing is that you know prior to the weekend lockdown, um, you know there's a rush, a mad dash to go out and get supplies and maybe get you know see family, relatives, and friends and everything. And okay, let's party because you know on Saturday and Sunday we're gonna be restrained. Yes. And so, to be honest with you, um, 
with the fact that we're not testing as much as we can, we don't even know if those are positive carriers. So we're, we're letting the floodgates open during the week. Mm -hmm. And then we're saying, okay, let's lock down in our homes on the weekend. And then we're going to open those floodgates again on Monday. And can and we put in there the curfew as well? Because the 7 p.m. curfew does that as well. Now you're yeah. now everyone goes to the grocery store for the, for the most part at the same time. Correct. And they feel anxious to do that because we have work. Some people are still working. Yeah. So the curfew being pushed up as well. And then with the lockdown of the weekend, I feel like all of that does add to the rush. And that's what we want to avoid, I would think. Yeah, which we should be avoiding that. We should be avoiding the additional stress. Mm -hmm. We should be avoiding the, um, uh, the reduction and and economic stability that we might find on a weekend all of these different things i'm not again i'm a scientist first mm -hmm. and so i know we're trying to slow transmission but you know we're not slowing much transmission on a saturday and sunday we're mm -hmm. not we're not going to do that what we need to do is continue to educate the community to social distance to wash their hands to wear masks yeah. seven days a week yeah. right seven days a week and, and actually try and see if we can, you know, you know, function in a way that uh, we can get our, our, you know, our country back, <laughs> kind of back to, I mean, it's not going to be back to normal, but we need to, we need to move in that direction at this point. Um, what I'd really like to know from a specialist like yourself is, would a two week lockdown be beneficial to the country? Would it serve? Um, as a beneficial response to the country right. for what we're doing to, to see a, a significant um, curb in numbers. What do you think? In its present state, I'll tell you. So there is one thing that I've learned from serving um, overseas during a pandemic, outside of a pandemic um, in, in the military, a really large organization. Um, and it's one thing that I can say is at the forefront is preparedness. Um, it is really, really important you know, as a country that we prepare, yeah. we get ready. Well, I, I, I guess we could say get ready to fight, right? Mm -hmm. we're, we're in a pandemic, we're, we're fighting a war. Yeah. This is basically a war, so that's how I look at it. Um, so to answer your question about a two week lockdown, let's say a two week lockdown. Now, when we first initially came and we started and the pandemic was new, there were minimal cases. I think when we first spoke, there was like one case. Um, at that point, our healthcare system was troubled. Right. Mm -hmm. So it was the suggestion at that point to lock down indefinitely, you know, whether it be a two week period or however long in order. So we, we do these lockdowns in order to, to slow transmission. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, initially, the lockdown would have slowed transmission long enough so that we could have armed ourselves and become prepared to fight where we are now and not maybe even get to where we are now, but to prevent where we are now. That unfortunately didn't happen. We had a lockdown, then we had an open up, and then we had a lockdown again. And so we found that it was counter effective. It, it did not work. Right now to lock down, our, our economy is in trouble. Mm -hmm. um, and we're just at a point where um, we have, I mean, it's something that I touch on every now and again when I talk about mental illness, um, um, abuse, now drug abuse, domestic violence, all of these different things that are happening now that are secondary to all of these different lockdowns. And unfortunately, our transmission rate has not slowed. So to say that, okay, let's go ahead and lock down again at this point in the game is probably not a very, very effective measure. And, um, yes. and, it, and it's primarily, like I said before, it, 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 the intent is to slow transmission in order to prepare, to arm, to fight. We, I feel, are beyond that, that yeah. period of, 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 you know, like preparedness. And now we're in the fight. And so we have to fight. Yeah, what I was curious to know was, and I did not, but what, would we have benefited from a two-week lockdown prior to now? I feel, and not just a lockdown, a complete shutdown, like not going anywhere, not doing anything. A complete shutdown for two weeks. Had we done that in the beginning, would we have been here? If we prepared what we did when we did have that lockdown, if that was a, a time for us as a country to prepare and we got um, we got trained professionals in, we upgraded our healthcare system, our hospital, we got protective gear, PPE equipment in, we got ventilators in, we started to prepare for this war, then it would have been effective. So so not just the two week lockdown, but are there are other no. really important no. factors that come Correct. into play Definitely. that would have helped us to Definitely. not be here Definitely. where we are today. Most definitely.
Because I look at other countries like Barbados and like New Zealand and I think Iceland. And these are places that are um, excelling compared to, of course, others. And they have just about, you know, either our population or more. And they're doing pretty well. And I and I know that some of them have implemented the two week lockdown, but that's why I asked. But it is crucial to understand that there's so many other factors. No, there are a lot of there are uh, there are so many things that go into play besides a two week lockdown. And so then it begs the question, what can we do at this point? (laughs) At this point, Um, at this point, it had, you know, things are extremely um, worrisome. Absolutely. You know, I call it I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm extremely I mean, me, myself, personally, not personally um, being familiar with um, infectious disease. I'm not you know, I'm not an infectious disease specialist, but I've worked closely with um, departments that have run pandemics as such. And um, I can tell you that, you know, our lack of per- preparedness, our lack of protocol in place, um, our lack of implementation of protocol when we opened our borders and et cetera, et cetera. All of these things are, um, you know, they're the re- they're the direct reason why I feel like we're in the situation that we're in now, and and that's unfortunate for the country. But we need to figure out how to, you know, not let it get. I mean, I feel like it is, you know, kind of out of control, and um, we need to to get the reins back. What was the biggest mistake? Was it opening the borders? Was that the first thing we did wrong? I I can tell you the first thing we we did wrong is we didn't prepare. You know what I mean? There, there. Initially, when we heard of the probability of a pandemic from Wuhan, China, back in November of 2000, 2019, there should have been a team set in place that should have started to prepare for something such as this. I mean, we've had an Ebola outbreak um, last year, and um, there are teams around the world that started to prepare for such a thing. Mm-hmm. We did it, and and I think that was the biggest that was the biggest mistake initially out the gate. Is that and and, I, and we spoke on this. I mean, we got together back in March, mm-hmm. and we came out and said, "Hey, okay, this is what's going on worldwide. This is what we're seeing in China now." And I think Italy had begun to 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 reap. Um, the COVID-19 and so we were looking worldwide and and actually examining what was going on and and I mean we're a small country where we have a high um, obesity rate our chronic illness is high this alone um, kind of raised antennas and said hey this is something that we should be you know we should be looking at we should start to prepare for but we didn't do that Yes. And, you know, I want to also talk to you about um, the importance of testing. Yes. And so we're going to get to that right after this commercial break. This year has been tough. Our world was flipped upside down. The only way we will come out of this better and stronger is if we all work together. That will require each of us to work individually toward a common goal. Here are some things we can all do to play our part. One, wash your hands. Having clean hands reduces the spread of COVID-19. Be sure to wash your hands all the way. Wet your hands. Use soap to lather them up. Wash the back of your hands, your palms, your fingers, and don't forget your wrists. Two, wear your mask correctly. Make sure it covers your chin, mouth, and nose all the way. Do not use a mask that is damaged, dirty, or wet. Handle your mask by using the elastic string. Store it in a clean, resealable bag. Three, practice social distancing. Stay at home as much as possible. Avoid crowds and avoid public places. When you must go out, stay at least six feet all the way from others. We can do this. We can do this. We can do this. Protect yourself. Save yourself. We can beat this. We can beat this. We can beat this. Let us each do our part. Protect yourself. Save yourself. Remember, protect yourself. Save yourself. Protect yourself. Save yourself. Wash your hands. Wear your mask. And practice social distancing. We were with you from the beginning. And we will continue to be with you each step of the way. This message was brought to you by the Progressive Liberal Party. Mm-hmm. 
on back to Coffee Break. We are here with my guest, Dr. Melissa Evans. So, of course, we wanted to talk about the increased testing method. How important is this to us at this rate? And then, you know, will it help essentially at this point? Most definitely. I, I think from day one, our party, our COVID task force's position has been we need mass testing. Yeah. Um, it is the only way that we can identify positive cases mm -hmm. and thus try and prevent transmission or spread to something that becomes un, you know, uncontrollable. Um, our, our number one point of our, our action plan is, is mass testing. We do believe that testing should be free for all Bahamians. It shouldn't have a cost. Um, you know, you shouldn't have a delayed um, results. You know, these are some of the things that we look at very, very carefully. And we feel like that is so important. Mass testing is so important right now. We've tested about 26,000 people in our, in our country and um, we're still not at our target 10% of the population. Um, so we're, we're, you know, we've, we've ramped up testing a bit in the past couple of months, which is a positive note, but we still need to do way more testing. We need to see uh, positive carriers out there. We need to be able to isolate them um, and so that transmission can slow a bit. But without the knowledge of positive cases, we have no idea who our super spreaders are. We have no idea, um, you know, where, where there are clusters, where, you know, we should, we should be, even though we're going to be vigilant anyway, we're going to wash our hands, we're going to practice social distancing, um, we're going to wear our masks all the time. It's really, really important for us to continue to mass test. That's, that's the most, we think, you know, one of the, the most important things right now to try and um, flatten this curve as we talk about all the time. Is it difficult considering it's already been mentioned so many times? We're now in the month of October. Is it difficult to do the mass testing? Speak to that. Um, I know I know that there's a backlog as far as the reference laboratory with the government. So that has become a, a, a challenge. And so now um, the private institution has taken up, I, I do believe the last numbers are about 50% of the testing. Unfortunately, the private institution charges for testing. Yeah. So um, that becomes something that is worrisome um, um, for the task force because there are a lot of people out there that really just can't afford to pay for testing. And so even if um, there's contract contact tracing being done and um, people um, coming in contact with positive cases, if they have to rely on the private sector for testing, then that, you know, that discourages, you know, potential testing. And so that that's why that's worrisome. We were speaking during the break about that delayed um uh, the delayed response to taking a test. So right. you won't get results until you said the average time would be five days sometimes. Yeah. And yet ministers, of course, we know we have a prime minister right now who's said to be in quarantine at the moment right. who would have gotten results the minute they took it. What, what can we, can we fix that? Because the average person in my personal opinion, just from my own knowledge, I feel like should be getting results right away because they leave they leave your testing center to then right. not know what is what they have and pretty much live their normal life. Correct. Right. Right. That's that's a very, very pertinent fact. Um, the fact that, you know, people are going out and getting tested and then there's such a long delay gives yes. them an opportunity to go into society, into the community. And if they're positive to potentially spread the virus. Yes. And so that's why it's so, so important for us to, to not only ramp up testing, mass testing, um, to, to make it free for Bahamians, but to also um, have a really rapid turnaround time. And you'll see that um, right now, in addition to what we call PCR testing, antigen testing is going to come in. Those are the rapid tests. Um, but again, we have to be very, very cautious. We have to make sure that these these tests are 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 are, are viable. Um, they've been validated, you know, um, and they're just not any type of test that you know people bring in to rapidly test. And really, the PCR test is going to be your gold standard of testing. But unfortunately, um, in the private sector, I do think that there's a turnaround time of um, at least 24 hours or so, which is excellent. But again, it, it, it's something that has to be paid for. And, and, you know, maybe a lot of the population can't really afford that. So that's something to think about. So we need quick, rapid um, results, PCR testing that that's free for behemoths. That's 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 what we're going to advocate. It concerns me because I feel like when we talk about one thing, then there's a monopoly of yes. other problems yes. that happen. So, yes, we can talk about increased testing, mass mm -hmm. testing, but then there are other factors that still have to be fixed right. as well. Right. We have to look at our isolation procedures, our quarantine procedures, and make sure that all of our contact tracing um, 
is it is efficient and adequate, which means that we need to train more people. Um, and, uh, another point in the in the action yeah. plan, we need to train more people to be able to perform contact tracing. We we don't have nearly enough people, not only in New Providence but in the family islands. We we're now seeing a, a bit of out, outbreaks in in other islands, and so we now need to be able to have contact tracing in these different areas and and to, to efficiently do it because it's the only way again to be able to put a finger on on on, on the transmission rate. But yeah, and I want to say that's the biggest part of it, at least from what I'm hearing, the training part. Yes, it's going to take time and it's probably going to take money. Right. And so I assume that's the reason. At least that's my assumption. Right. What's yours? Um, you <laughs> Why know, what? have we not done this? I, I, again, that's the biggest question um, that this COVID task force has. Like we like I said, we're, we're into the eighth month. Yeah. And, um, you know, we, we I imagine myself personally, I imagine that. Um, initially, these were the parameters that were going to be put in place. We were going to start training people that, you know, can perform contact tracing. Mm -hmm. We would be um, looking at facilities that we can expand in order to, to, to be able to take on um, more of the community should they get sick. We were supposed to um, look at the healthcare professionals. You know, we have bra uh, what we call brain drain here in the country where we don't have enough nurses. We don't have enough doctors. Um, we have nurses going on strike. We have a lot of our healthcare professionals going into quarantine because they have been um, exposed to the virus because they didn't have the proper PPE gear, personal protective equipment gear. And so again, these are all shortfalls that came in the preparedness part of, of what we should have done and we haven't done. And, and so we're paying for it now. Mm -hmm. How important is this vaccine going to be? How excited or nervous should we be for the vaccine? Um, that's a really, really good question. Uh, I, 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 I've been looking at um, what the science, the science has been saying for the past couple months on the vaccine, mm -hmm. and um, scientists around the world. I, I think every scientist in every laboratory, this is this has become the front line yeah. of, of defense now. Is the vaccine, yeah. um, and I do think it's gonna it's gonna be a challenging vaccine to complete. Uh, although you know many parts of the world seem to think different, they say you know this is something that we're gonna do, but we're looking at several different strains of a virus and so we're going to have to look at a vaccine that is able you know to build immunity for all of those viral strains mm -hmm. and so that alone is a challenge you know what i mean we're still looking for you know you're still looking for a vaccine for other things like hiv we haven't found it after all these years mm -hmm. i'm not being pessimistic i'm just saying that um should i be excited about a, such a vaccine i am excited to, to, to slow transmission and, and and prevention i'm excited about that i think that we can really really do that um, if we really, really take our personal responsibility, you know what I mean? I think we can slow transmission, but a vaccine, um, that's that's yet to be determined how effective it's going to be, um, when we should have a vaccine, who's, you know, who's going to be open to the vaccine, yeah, the first, first round of people to the vaccine. These are all questions that, I mean, I'm sure the general public have, I have, mm -hmm. and so I'm really eager to see um, exactly the outcome of such a vaccine. But I can tell you that, you know, we're, it's going to be very, very interesting to see, you know, it come out, out of the blocks. Do you remember the time back in 2003 when you were dealing with SARS? Do you, do you ever remember being afraid that it wasn't going to end? Was there a period? I'm trying to figure out the maybe the similarities between no. yeah. this virus and then. Right. And, and did the vaccine come very quickly? I mean, take us so that time as well. So um, when I, I, br I briefly uh, worked with um, the military in Lanshul, Germany um, during the SARS outbreak because all of the military soldiers would head to that hospital if there was they were suspected and for contact tracing of their families, etc. Um, the I would say the the I was way more prepared, I think, for what was happening back then, because I felt like I was a part of an organization that was prepared and, and, and organized wow. and, and ready to, to kind of um, execute uh, effective treatment. And, and you felt uh, that during I that time? I felt that during that time. I felt <laughs> like, you know, I felt confident. I said, you know, you know, we have wow. this in place. We're going to execute. Mm -hmm. We're going to attack this this virus. And mm -hmm. this is going to be it. And you'll see that the numbers are way different. I mean, we're mm -hmm. talking about two different things, two different variables. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of worried about this one. We've, yeah. we've, um, we've kind of lost control a bit. Our healthcare system is in no way prepared. I, and, and again, 
no healthcare system around the world globally was prepared for COVID-19. Yeah. I mean, you, you you notice in China, they had to build an extra hospital. Um, they they had to do some extra things in Italy, the United States, after all of these months, you know, it is a powerhouse worldwide. They're still having a difficult time. And so I don't think globally anyone was prepared, but I do think, um, you know, some countries are learning as they go. It's, you know what I mean? It's a learning curve for, for, for most countries and they look at, you know, kind of the trends and they're trying to, to go along with the trends and, and, and fix it. Because like you mentioned, there are countries that are doing very, very well and um, you know per capita, and they're compar comparably you know the same per capita as us, and they're doing much better than the Bahamas is doing. So and so that worries me a bit. Well, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you about your line of work that you're in now. Right. You you you're you work with a um, you basically work with sleeping disorders. Yeah. yeah. And that is, I would like to say, a you know. Basically, I mean, that type of work is directly related to, I would say, stress-related issues and then mental-related okay. issues. Um, what have you seen in recent time in your office right. with all this going on? Okay, so I own, I own and operate a sleep diagnostic testing facility, right? Mm -hmm. So before COVID-19, primarily, I would say 90% of the cases that came um, into the facility were uh, respiratory breathing disorders or sleep apnea, people mm -hmm. who have difficulty breathing during their sleep. Since COVID-19, I can say that um, our parasomnia presentation has more than doubled. I would say or, or, or increased by 100%, which means that people are now coming in um, with more reported cases of insomnia, sleep terrors, nightmares. Um, and, and, and this primarily, it, it's secondary to mental illness, of course, mm -hmm. and stress. And I, and I do think it's, it, it can be directly correlated to, to the pandemic that's here because it didn't present in the 10 years that I was here. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't think I saw, you know, so many cases of insomnia like patterns or people that had you know problems going to sleep or people who woke up having nightmares and you know other types of paras what we call parasomnia or, or behavioral mm -hmm. problems during sleep and so that leads me to believe like you know there are definitely an increase in, in some mental illness out there and that's something that we you know we're not even touching on we need to really look at that closely and and that's why i i bring it up because and i assume that it's not just directly related to the virus itself but people are not employed people are right. home correct. longer correct i read somewhere that because i myself have been experiencing more visual dreams right and i had read at least about two articles one on the new york times that was talking about people having more vivid dreams yes most because definitely. of just being you know, I guess we're maybe more in our minds, maybe now more than we may have had time to be before. No, and I mean, you're, you're so right. We have an economic factor that's in play now. We have, you know, you know, kids that have been home for, for a seven, yeah. eight months and, you know, the education factor. And so you'd have to realize that. So, you know, during a pandemic such as this, it's going to cause an increased heightened anxiety. Mm -hmm. So anxiety, of course, is like a fight or flight for your system. Mm -hmm. Your heart beats faster. You're in a position to fight yeah. or run. Right. Yeah. So you're producing chemicals within the body that 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 really should only be produced in a fight or flight situation mm -hmm. on a normal, wow. on a regular basis. So if you if you think about the science of it then it's, it, it, you know, you realize that it's normal that you're going to sleep and you're waking up and you're nervous, or you might have more visual um, or vivid, you know, dreams, nightmares, sleep terrors in kids, these kind of things, because, you know, these are chemicals that are being produced because your body is, is preparing to fight. Mm -hmm. And um, unfortunately, this is, this is, you know, this is, this is a problem, you know, not only for sleep, but, but generally, uh, you know, for families out there that are, you know, yeah, that are having economic difficulties that our kids are out of school and and we just don't know what's going to happen see and just, that was my question we say these things we know we're in a crisis yeah but what what we don't you what know, what's, what's going to happen i mean it's, men, this it's, point? it's it's i'm going to tell you it's mentally i mean i mean it's for everybody from every socioeconomic yeah. background you're talking about everyone, everyone you know what i mean we don't know what tomorrow is going to bring we don't know we know that we need to try and protect ourselves. We need to try and um, um, make sure that our family is safe and that they're fed, et cetera. And, and these are the things that are concerning families now. And so mm -hmm. those are the things that we need to really, really you know, be cognitive of. 
Absolutely. So I understand, obviously, that you you have a lot of persons that you see in your uh, you know your line of work, right? With sleep solutions, what I, I'm I'm interested in that because um, this conversation of mental health, you know, we as Bahamians, we haven't been able to really catch a break. I think yeah. about Hurricane Dorian. I think about Hurricane Definitely. Matthew. I think about even the, the amount of outages we had last year's summer. And then just to lead into a huge pandemic. Right. We have really been through a lot. Yeah. And uh, as Bahamians, how is it, you know, you spoke about your office, but what kinds of persons are you seeing? Yeah. What kinds of persons are you interacting with? So you, it's such a really, really good, valid point. We don't talk about it nearly enough. We need to start talking about it way more because I feel like it's going to be, you know, I mean, not going to be, but it is something that's, you know, looking at the virus and the health aspect of the virus itself, but we really need to look at the mental health issue. And yes, in um, my sleep uh, facility, I do see a lot of um, civil servants, a lot of police officers, and I can tell you, um, they come in and... It, it, you know, it's hard. It's, it's, you know, the things that they're seeing, there's an, an increase, like I mentioned before, of domestic violence, alcoholism. Um, and we just haven't caught a break. Like you said, Dorian has passed. Um, there are people on lockdowns now. And so it's affecting us big time mentally. I mean, we, you know, there are a lot of people that they've reduced um, um, finances now um, mm -hmm. for persons at, at NIB and stuff like that. And and so this is affecting um, our our frontline workers are out there. They're working double, triple shifts because a lot of their co-workers have been quarantined or have tested positive for the virus. And so now the pressure is on them and they're coming in and they do have a lot of sleep disturbances, much more than I've seen before. Wow. And they are secondary um, to the mental illness that's out there. And so we do need to have this conversation about mental illness. This is something that's that's really, really important, no matter, you know, from which aspect of life that you're in, is yeah. that this is tough. This yes. is tough. This is tough. And, and, you know, children, I've seen more children than I've ever seen in, in my whole career. Wow. And it's because um, of the just, you know, it's, it's, it's unpredictable. They don't know when things are going to go back to normal, if they ever will go back to normal. So that in its own will call, cause some type of me mental problem that we just don't talk about. And you mentioned officers. I'm, I'm thinking, and I've heard a little bit of just talk, but I even just thinking, and I don't think we think about our officers enough, right. you think about them manning the street 7 right. p.m. Right. through the night till Correct. the a.m. Right. And then, of course, now the weekends. Right. I did hear one officer say within his own words, just speaking human to human, but he's tired. No, they're they're exhausted. They're fatigued. They're they're they they they're mentally, physically fatigued. And and again, and and so one of the things we try and do is give them behavioral modifications because they're working several different shifts. Mm -hmm. Their sleep patterns are off. Um, and so, and then when they have the ability to go to sleep, they can't sleep because they're so mentally stressed about what's going this on. This is so interesting. This yeah. is so interesting. You have officers and he told me within it with just himself that this is, you know, this isn't really what I signed up for. No, I mean, and not only officers, I, you know, there's also the nurses. Think about, you know, the nurses, the, the healthcare practitioners, the first responders, the EMT workers, mm. all of these people that have been working, our frontline workers that have been working around the clock. They have to leave their families. They all, mm -hmm. they are always at mm -hmm. risk. They have to be concerned about mm -hmm. that. Um, they have families at home that they have to go home to after their shifts and ha they have to be concerned about, you know, are they going to be transmitting the virus? Mm. Are they in quarantine? So, I mean, it just, just across the board, we're talking about mental illness as a factor and it's something that's very, very important. I not only look at the data for viruses, mm -hmm. but I do look at the data for, for mental illness and, you know, what something like this pandemic can cause mm -hmm. as far as, you know, mental problems within a community. Those are some of the global health risks and factors that, that you have to pay attention to that we're just not addressing enough. And I think we need to, yeah. to, to do a better job with that. Totally agreed with you. So we have, one, one, one of the reasons why I was so excited to have you on the show was because you are one of the first, if I'm not mistaken, one of the first persons that are that is not necessarily in a political seat. And I like that because I feel like we've been having a lot of political discussions right. around something that is affecting everyone in right. such a personal way. Right. For you, how has that been for you in terms of realizing 
you know, how we're dealing with this. Yeah. Are we really focused on the issue at hand or have we kind of been playing around with it? What's your opinion on that? Um, I can say, I can say wholeheartedly, uh, this, this pandemic hits really, really close to home for me. It is so important for me with, with whatever training I have um, for me to, to jump into this fight. I do believe that everything else needs to step aside. We need to all come together. We've been challenged, uh, and you know, as a task force, we've been challenged um, to even come in and give a helping hand. And I think that that's that, you know, we need to get past that. We need to get all specialties. I mean, everybody involved 100%. And, and, and you know, there are, there are professionals that can be worldwide fighting this fight. But, you know, we're here. We want to make sure that our children are able, you know, to see the future. We want to get rid of this. We want to eradicate this pandemic, yeah. right? When I say eradicate, get rid of. We want to be able to, to say that, hey, this is something that happened. We live past it. But we need to really, really put all of that other stuff aside for a minute and really get together and spread awareness, education, and, and even when we're open, even globally, if we, you know, when we start accepting tourists in and um, people start coming in and traveling again, we need to continue to spread this awareness to our public that, you know, we still need to wear our masks. We still need to be vigilant. This, this is still a war that we need to fight. We all need to come together to fight it. Yes. That's really, really passionate for me. I'm, 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 I'm an advocate of of, of just making sure that, that that we get past it, like I think that should be the, at the forefront of everyone of, of everyone's plan, whether it be um, you know the the government or the opposition or, and, and that's our plan, that's our task, that's our our goal in the task force is, is to get past um, all you know a lot of the 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 political restraints mm -hmm. that are there and to to really help. Yes. So we can actually, you know, be successful. All of us, yeah, all I think of us everyone. Are in this. Exactly. I think and I, we forget that sometimes no, I feel like. Yeah, definitely. We are really in this together. This is really not a, a blue and red situation. No. This is really a human to human this situation. A, we're in a crisis. Definitely. What do you think about the way we have looked at this? I feel like, you know, we've been in we've been here since March. Right. And persons are at this point exhausted yes and so i saw a tweet the other day that said you know just because you're over it doesn't mean it's over no so especially i think in particularly young people i mean i'd like to say the older people as well but how are we taking this as serious as we should as well the you know obviously we've seen videos people right. gathering and yeah. people still we want to just get past this but yeah. how should we be how, how are you all gonna attack also presenting that we're still really we're still here. in it we're still in the fire we're in the fire and it's not even you know diminished we're fire the, we're, we're in the flames <laughs> and yeah. i can't express that enough is one of the reasons why i want to come out and give as much education and awareness as possible um and i don't know whether it's it's growing up bohemian that i have my fight yeah. or being a part of a military organization yeah. that i have my fight but i'm like listen we're in a fight we yeah. have to continue to fight we have to stay vigilant we have to stay on top of this we can't we can't put our guard down and think that it's gone yeah. or it's going because that's when you know things are going to get progressively worse we have to stay vigilant we have to, to, to stay social distancing i can't say that enough children have to understand um even as kids and, and it's unfortunate that they have to you know think about these kind of things but they need to make sure that they are continuously washing their hands um kids adults um older people that are at risk big time so these are things that we can't relax we can't we can't relax these things for a minute we have to stay in the fight you know we we should have prepared we should have been prepared okay so that's passed so let's let's fight now let's execute and and get past this that's important I agree with you so i hope i hope that um we've sp spread some education and, and and we've learned some stuff today i think we have i hope so i think we have you have been such a great um person to have this conversation with, to speak Thank about you. the mental aspect of Thank it, you. to Important. speak about the physical aspect of it. Thank Important. you so much for your work, your contribution, and your time today. Thank you so much that. for having me. It was so good talking to you. <laughs> yes, you as well. And thank you all, our audience, for tuning in to Coffee Break. I am your guest host, April Sands. And of course, you'll see us next time, same place, same time. <laughs>